as a coherent, organized, influential node of economic thought gives me enormous pleasure, uh, in no small part because I had nothing to do with it personally. <laughs> it belongs to a younger generation. And for those of us in the older generation, it's always a little bit of a surprise to discover that there is a younger generation. <laughs> uh, not that much younger, frankly, but, but still with a longer professional life expectancy. So there is hope that this is truly the beginning. And that raises the question, where do things stand? And what should come next? I think that question is already very much on the agenda, but let me just give you a sketch of my view of it. MMT, as I read it, has been, maybe still is, primarily the work of a community of teachers, drawing on the practical understanding and didactic skills of some financial market players of great talent and distinction, Warren, of course, Primum Inter Paris, and a shared, continuous reading of John Maynard Keynes on the subject, that was a great deal to Paul Davidson, and indeed of the full spectrum of monetary history and the history of economic thought, to which, of course, Robert Skidelsky uh, has made uh, extraordinary contributions. Taking the structure of the conference for a guide, I see developments in a number of directions, two of them perhaps uh, standing out, policy programs, which are being advanced uh, with uh, great energy, I think, and effectiveness, and economic models, which continue to be developed partly in a tradition uh, that uh, was uh, uh, set uh, in route many years ago uh, by Wynn Godley and colleagues at the Levy Institute and with extensions in numerous directions, such as law, international comparisons, ecology, and the environment. And I see a further strong development of the pedagogical materials, and in particular, the extremely important and I think very welcome introduction of a full-fledged textbook uh, from Bill Mitchell and colleagues, uh, which creates the possibility uh, to extend the uh, reach of the program to uh, a whole range of classroom settings where it has not been present so far. Um, I noticed that all of these uh, effervescent energetic developments have tended perhaps to diminish, uh, to crowd out, to use a very compromise term, um, the habit of devoting space to criticism of the so-called mainstream. I think that's a good thing. I think the work of criticism is honorable and necessary, but it absorbs bandwidth. It absorbs bandwidth. And after a point, it impedes the development of an alternative to school. If you're always constructing arguments to address to people who are not listening to you, it not only is a frustrating experience in its own right, but it tends to slow down the coalescence of an alternative which has its own internal structure, logic, and uh, capacity to develop and grow. Uh, so this seems to me to be very, all, very much in the way of positive developments. I am not myself a member of the Central Committee of the MMT Revolutionary Council, <laughs> but permit me anyway uh, to suggest to those who are here who may be, and I'm sure you're all carefully anonymous, that's the way the anti-war movement was organized in my youth. <laughs> to suggest some strategic objectives, both for their own sake and to strengthen this core intellectual and analytical program. The first is to build and develop 
a policy presence. To seek actively, aggressively to be heard and represented in the national policy sphere. I know this is very much on the minds of some of you here, and progress has been made. But given that you have uh, the foundations laid and the programs developed, it is time to insist that the national conversation include this point of view. This is how political progress eventually gets made. It's something which develops over time once representation has been established. Congressional hearings, the Federal Reserve conferences, when should we lay bets perhaps on when the first MMT presentation will be made at Jackson Hole? Uh, uh, yeah, not in your lifetime. I, I, that could be right. But, uh, uh, nevertheless, I favor setting ambitious objectives. And there are Washington symposia and roundtables, a spectrum of outlets which not only have uh, a presence in the, in the policy debate for their own right, but also give access uh, to the larger uh, sphere of the media. This is not an easy task, but when you've got the movement that is presently underway, you want you to take it seriously enough yourselves to insist that it has a right to be present and heard in these discussions. And the second is even more difficult. The first will not be achieved in Paul's lifetime. The second will probably not be achieved in mine. So I won't say demand that MMT and related appointments be made at a wider spectrum of universities and that they be uh, established in the so-called mainstream universities, the ones that have the rich endowments and the command over uh, faculty appointments in the economics profession. I won't say that. I'll say call attention to the fact that such appointments have not been made. Call attention to the fact that in the uh, 10 years now, since the onset of the great financial crisis, so far as I'm aware, not a single one of our self-important so-called top economics department has made a single such appointment of anybody who was genuinely in the dissenting tradition who called attention to the dangers in advance. So far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I can be corrected on that. I think I would have heard about it if it had occurred. This is a source of shame and embarrassment to the, let's say, reputation of this country to be a place of open and constructive and progressive debate. It is a sign of how closed and stultified and determined to evade the basic realities to which you in this room have been calling attention, the economics <coughs> profession, as it is dominated by these particular departments and by the journals uh, that act as the gatekeepers to appointments in those departments, have become. Calling attention to this fact is not going to change it, at least not at once. But it may eventually awaken university administrators to the fact that the institutions that they run and back are falling dangerously out of step with the mood of the country and with the intellectual developments that matter in economics. So having said that, let me now speak a bit about intellectual direction. Modern monetary theory is characteristically described as a macroeconomic analysis. And the difficulty of any macroeconomic analysis in the economics profession has been the isolation of the whole subject into a small academic ghetto 
uh, in preparation, of course, for its extinction. In mainstream departments, macroeconomics barely exists. The word has been, to the extent that it's still used at all, has been appropriated for a theoretic exercises in time series analysis and things of that nature. And the few voices who still speak in terms that are recognizable uh, to the even the tradition of academic macroeconomics that was prevalent 40 or 50 years ago, uh, are working with models that they learned in graduate school and which they have not thought to examine since, and even if they did think to examine it, it would be a deeply <laughs> painful exercise uh, uh, from which uh, uh, the results would be, uh, of course, very uncertain. Uh, it brings to mind a comment of my father's that one of the characteristic features of economists is that they were extremely economical with their thinking. <laughs> uh, made the lessons that they learned in graduate school extend for an entire lifetime. Um, I'm not sure that this particular tendency, that is to say to isolate macroeconomic topics into a small uh, separated enclave in the economics profession can be overcome, or that it would be adequate if that enclave came to be occupied by modern monetary theorists in the way that a dissenting class analysis was for a generation or two occupied by the house Marxists uh, in many economics departments. So I would offer a different countermeasure, which is that a new economics macro-based economics, challenged the dominant microeconomics on its own ground. What business do they have asserting that their perspective on our subject is the one that should control the way the subject evolves over time? I can see this challenge developing here already up to a point. One avenue is to tie macroeconomic analysis to an exploration of the cost of resources and the environment. An indispensable subject which commingles demand and supply effects that the mainstream would like to keep separated, isolating supply effects to this abstract thing called potential outputs and demand effects uh, to the flows of spending. In my view, I'm not a particularly optimistic person about this subject. Resource questions make the task of full employment and price stability more difficult. But they exist. They cannot be ignored. And to incorporate them competently into an economic analysis requires how they, understanding how they work in speculative financial markets. It's prime territory for modern monetary theory as uh, uh, if there were an oil economist here, like, for example, Paul Davidson, he would probably tell you. I see him nodding, so I take that for confirmation. Legal and institutional analysis is another vector into the larger sphere now dominated by microeconomics. Here the work of Bill Black. I went over to that table a few minutes ago and said, my god, all the devils are here. <laughs> uh, on the pathology of organizations is critical. Codes, laws, regulations, these things exist and have developed for a reason. There is no such thing as a self-regulating structure. The notion that regulation is an imposition a distortion created to deal with, introduced to deal with externalities or imperfections, something with cost and benefits, is a fundamental misstatement of the case. Going back, of course, a long way. It overlooks the biophysical principle that no living, me living mechanical, or social system exists without regulation. The life process is one of extracting and using resources 
within the bounds of tolerance of the materials at hand. Your body regulates how you do this, temperature, blood pressure, the rest. Your automobile regulates how you do this with a radiator and other people. As Jing Chen and I have argued, biophysical economics is an encompassing framework for reconciling social phenomena with thermodynamic laws, and that immediately places you in the sphere of an evolutionary analysis, a time-flowing unidirectional analysis, uh, which is intellectually compatible with Keynes's view of the monetary process and the modern monetary theory. The biophysical idea that large entities are efficient and therefore necessary to sustain advanced societies. Big is Beautiful is the title of a forthcoming book. I won't say what's by. Um, not me. Uh, confronts the rising fashion uh, for neo schumacherian neo-Thurman-Arnoldian, uh, small is beautiful antitrust approaches, a, something which is uh, deeply seductive to the presently dominant neoliberal framework uh, in Washington and in policy circles generally, and which has been capably popularized by Barry Lynn in recent days, who has, I must say, with the adroit help of his former employer, uh, managed to turn himself into an apparent su supposed victim of big bad movement. An example of his own argument, in other words, that his ideas are so, so fantastically insurrectionary that there had to be a monopoly out there to suppress them. But in the real world, let's face it, networks tend toward monopoly for the straightforward reason that declining average costs. Uh, and as my father wrote 50 years ago in the new industrial state, big organizations exist for a reason, to plan and control their environments from the design to the marketing phases, as well as the financial and regulatory environments, uh, and to control the application of technology to advanced uh, production because without that you cannot take advantage of the specialized scientific knowledge that you have to apply uh, in particular production processes. And he remarked in that book that if an architect in New York were completely committed to the view that no construction could be done without load-bearing walls, he would have a trouble passing to the skyscrapers from the brownstones. And this is the problem of the neo schumacherian view, uh, that we do live in a society where big and small necessarily coexist. MMT needs to enter this question, especially with reference to banks where I think the case actually for breaking them up from their present scale is much stronger than it is for network-based corporations. But a development of that analysis, what I might call a modern industrial organization, might be a useful ally as this movement expands its scope and begins to encroach on the territory that the microeconomists uh, have preserved for themselves. Now, the discussion of big and small leads me on to a final topic, uh, which it will perhaps not surprise you uh, to hear a few words on, namely my own interest and work on inequality. I was led into this more than 20 years ago uh, at a time when it was perhaps the least prestigious academic topic uh, available for economists. I remember in graduate school being told that studying inequality was like watching the grass grow. I thought that sounds pretty interesting to me. <laughs> uh, but at the time that I started looking into this, it was to evaluate a mainstream debate. Inequality was 
grudgingly admitted to be rising? Was it technology or was it trade in their effects on labor demand or labor supply? And I realized I could not add anything useful to this discussion without developing better measurements, better data, something that was more systematic and comprehensive uh, and through which one could begin to interpret patterns that were emerging over time. That led me into this, another extremely low prestige activity, economic statistics. Neglected, uh, I think, in a way which did enormous damage uh, to an understanding of the development of economic inequality because people were working with data that was so scarce, noisy, and inconsistent uh, that it was like watching, doing a Rorschach test. You could make anything out of it that your prejudices uh, thought um, you know, suitable. And this work, economic statistics applied to a um, bottom of the tier topic, uh, bottom tier topic, led over time to the development of the empirically grounded University of Texas Inequality Project, which has come to produce what is the largest single concept, consistent independently measure, that is to say, every observation based on measurements for that country in that year, not interpolated from other years of other countries, uh, set of country year inequality observations in the world. And it was only after doing that and beginning to examine whether there were discernible patterns in the data, which there were, and whether they could be associated with clear-cut economic interpretation, which they could, uh, that the following facts began to become clear. First, that there is a single dominant pattern of the movement of pay and income inequality in the world economy. That is to say, we are particularly, if you are in one of the smaller countries, but all throughout the world, affected by a pattern of forces that have a global character. This pattern, it appears, coincides in a way which is largely unmistakable with major changes of financial regime. With the dismantling of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, with the world debt crisis that began in 1980, 81, and with the uh, drop in interest rates and reversal to higher commodity prices that began in 2000. And these things, which bear, emerge from the data, these turning points which emerge from the data, clearly coincide with important historical events at the global, in the global financial sphere, and drive the movement of inequality around the world. And the third point is that exchange rates are for most countries a massive force for the transmission of inequality from the global to the national level. And you can see this very clearly. Once you have proper data, this is the case. I won't spend my time here demonstrating these points, but only draw their implication. Let's remember that factor prices, wages, profits, rent, are the major reason for the existence of microeconomics and also of labor economics in the first place. That's the large, largest point of this entire intellectual exercise is to associate pay with productivities uh, and to explain why people are paid what they are. But now it turns out that distribution is driven by monetary and macro change, not by local factors in separated markets, but at the global scale by world forces tempered at best by local and national institutions. Forces don't affect everything in the same way. Some places have stronger capacity to modulate them than others. But the forces are clearly identified operating at the macro scale. And so I have to conclude, to give the devil his due, that Robert Lucas was right. Can I say it again? <laughs> Robert Lucas is right. It is absurd uh, to have entirely separate disciplines, 
macro and micro, that are intellectually incompatible and that coexist mm -hmm. under the same economic, uh, academic roof. The only problem is that Robert Lucas chose the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> he chose the wrong one. Our work, your work, provides a framework which goes far beyond the cloistered categories in which macroeconomics is, to which macroeconomics has traditionally been assigned and gives, you, gives us an opportunity to provide a coherent explain, uh, uh, explanations of a great many things uh, which have been uh, reserved to a fully inadequate intellectual framework up to now. Now, I'm not a fan of PowerPoint, but I'm not going to let you escape it altogether, <laughs> because I want to push the inequality analysis in one other direction that I think is of some interest uh, here in the United States at the moment. That is to say, its relationship uh, to American uh, politics. Uh, and in particular to the question, uh, how did we end up, after all, with this fellow Donald Trump? Well, Trump ran a populist campaign, uh, and uh, the uh, question one might ask is, uh, was he elected on the strength of resentment of great inequalities? Well, one way to ask that question, which is interesting, is to take note of the fact that American presidential elections are decided on a state-by-state -state basis through a device called the Electoral College with winner-take-all in each state. And so one might ask, in the states where inequality rose the most, uh, did Trump benefit from a resentment of that rising inequality? To ask that question, one has to have a measure of the rise of inequality on a state-by-state -state basis and until the year 2000, such measures were only available on a 10-year basis from the census because the current population survey just isn't big enough to reliably tell you what's going on in North Dakota or Rhode Island and so forth. Well, by using the same techniques that we've applied at the global level with other data sets, employment and earnings, we developed a measure of annual inequality, income inequality, or pay inequality in each state. Uh, and uh, uh, we're able to answer this question or address this question at the annual level. Uh, at, I guess at the annual level. So let me see if I which button do I have to push to? That one, I think. No, that one turned it off. <laughs> All right, let me try again. That's the laser pointer. Where are we? Can you bring me up again? I guess I want to push the arrows that go left and right. That would be a sensible thing to do. I could push a button that would unplug the VGA. <laughs> there we are. Okay, so here's a, a, a portrait of the vote, blue and red, uh, Clinton and Trump. I guess this is my county. Uh, and I want to show you what the, the case for 1988. The change in inequality from the period before 1969 uh, and the, uh, the votes as between Michael Dukakis in blue diamonds and uh, George H.W. Bush in red circles, and you can see there's no real association. But that's the period quite a long time ago, uh, from the late 1960s to the late 1980s. Uh, I could show you the intervening elections, but if you fast forward to 2016, here's the result. Wow. And of the states, that, of the 14 largest, of 14 states with the largest increase in inequality uh, in the period from uh, 1990 to 2016, uh, all 14 voted for Hillary Clinton. All 14. The states with the lowest increases in inequality voted for Donald Trump. Not all of them, but overwhelming figures suggest to me that this is something significant and interesting and worth explaining. I would explain it in very simple terms. 
that the states with the biggest increase of inequality have two characteristics to their population. A large, relatively low income minority population growing very rapidly, and an important urban professional population dominated by finance and technology and other advanced industries, which is also a Democratic Party constituency. The states that went for Trump, generally speaking, both of these forces are less important. Right? So if you look at where New York is and where California is, I mean, it's very out far to the, to the right here on this diagram, you can see, I think, as well as Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, what has become of the Democratic Party in our time as evaluated through a simple metric of state-by-state -state changes in economic inequality. Does this have anything to do with modern monetary theory? Well, of course it does. Because after all, what is driving the rise in inequality in a state like New York or Connecticut? It is clearly the evolution of the economy to a uh, structure that is dominated by play such a central role in any proper monetary theory, and that are absent entirely from the mainstream view of this country. So I just put that out to you to say that the more you do with a range of analyses that start from uh, uh, a, um, let's say, an examination of the structure of the economy as a whole, in many different directions, the more you understand the deep and extensive relevance of the work that is going on here uh, today. <coughs> Thanks very much indeed. that I learned from Black, it's not necessary to hope in order to persevere. Yeah. Uh, but yes, is it hopeful? Uh, what does it mean for the future? Uh, uh, assuming you think the Democratic Party is a vector of hope, um, <laughs> which I have some trouble with, um, but putting it more neutrally, maybe I have another slide here. Uh, yeah, there's the, there are the states. And um, the... Um, what you see, in fact, are some of the states that Trump won narrowly, uh, like uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, are actually moving away from the democratic structure of things because they are losing their, uh, uh, the relative weight of their industrial class uh, without uh, gaining uh, much on the order of you know, high-income urban professionals or anything else. So that strikes me as uh, a, an argument that the, what emerged this year uh, is, you now assuming we don't, I mean, uh, who knows what will happen given what, you know, the, 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 the circus was going on in American politics at the moment. Uh, but in an ordinary uh, evolution of things, that this is not something that was incidental or can be easily recovered might be recovered once, but the trends are against the Democrats. On the other hand, through the South, it's going the other way. All right, so from North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, one level or another, you have rapidly growing immigrant uh, Hispanic populations, notably, and rapidly growing cities with the same kind of urban liberalism that you have elsewhere. Texas voted more strongly for Clinton than it voted for Obama four years ago, about four points. That's a big shift, right? Other questions, we're going to kind of jump around. What about free trade agreements? Uh, sound, your comments on that sounded like uh, you, you may be suggesting we don't should do, we do away with them. Or something. We're well, I, I, we're not going to do away with them for two reasons. One is that, I mean, it's clear that this was all a feint on the Republican side. Because if they actually, uh, if they restored the industrial base of the upper Midwest, they would be restoring the Democratic Party there, which they don't want to do. 
Uh, at the same time, they would be wrecking the Republican Party in Texas, which they also don't want to do. So I, I think it's safe to say that uh, at the end of the day, we're going to be stuck with the same policies that we have now uh, that we had before. Got a mic, got a mic. So my name is Adrian. I'm a student from Miami. Uh, so my question is: Do you think uh, primarily this is um, something that should be fought in an academic setting or in the more political, like activist kind of setting? Primarily. Speaking? Well, I think the things have to be integrated. I'm an old congressional staffer, uh, and you know, an effective campaign has to draw on academic resources and then project them out into politics, into the media. Um, and it has to, but also conscious that, that you, have to, you have to lean on the, on the academic establishments to sustain them and not to freeze them out and, and strangle them in the crib, which is what, of course, their instinct will be in this spirit of academic freedom under which we live. Um, so, but definitely the political arena is one which needs to be engaged. And uh, the point I would make is that looking around this room and at this program, you have the firepower now to do it. Yes. Which probably wasn't true three years ago. Right. At a certain point, enough comes together that uh, you say, look, we're here. We can't be ignored. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm from uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, became acquainted recently with Richard Florida's book, uh, the urban crisis, and he makes a similar point to the one you made about uh, which uh, which states uh, voted blue and uh, which states didn't. Uh, and although he localizes more in uh, in metropolitan areas, and uh, points out that uh, the greatest uh, inequality is in those areas that uh, have a higher proportion of what he calls the creative class or more progressive cities, and that in uh, less progressive or conservative cities, uh, the inequality seems, uh, seems less. Uh, so I wonder if there's a, a point at which uh, economic analysis and uh, sociological analysis uh, uh, come together uh, in a way that would uh, shed light on, uh, on what's happening in our, in our urban areas and and they, in some ways, seem to dominate uh, state politics. Well, there's some uh, parallelism, but I, I have to say I bridle at the notion that bankers are the leading uh, figures of the creative class. Uh, it, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's a way of flattering the egos of people who have money to use terminology of that kind. We are just dealing with you know, people who are rich. Uh, and many of them have, uh, you know, they would, they would rather control a Democratic Party, for a lot of reasons, that have to live under a Republican one, which they can also live under. Uh, and so you've had this coalition, which has been the case of the Democratic Party since the 1990s, in which policies in our sphere are essentially derived from the financial sector, are essentially directly what the financial sector wants. That was true in the 1990s under Bill Clinton. That was true in the 2000s under, under Obama. Right? Uh, and the base of the party is expected to vote for it whether or not their interests are being served by those policies. That's the way the Democratic Party has been run, and it's a model which broke down in 2016 in a major way. And that's a fact, I think it seems to me. That's a fact. Now, admittedly, the guy who came in may not be able to hold together but we'll a, 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 a contrary coalition because he's got his own political problems. But the problems of the Democratic Party are, are, are not going to go away, even if we, um, you know, whatever happens on the Republican side, until they're done with it. Hi, I'm Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. And my question is, given the nature of tribalism within the duopoly, within these two parties, is there another outside way of impacting them beyond that initial blue versus red to kind of penetrate this particular message that you're showing. What we're seeing right now is almost just point blank rejection from Jump Street 
um, when they go outside of their tribal boundaries. Can you address that? Can you rephrase that? I'm not sure I really understood your point. So the object here is, is that you know, economics is relatively neutral. It does advise your policy positions, et cetera, based on your priorities. But within the two parties, they have a very, very, you, you had just mentioned it basically in terms of they could count on these votes no matter what. Didn't matter whether it served their needs or not. And what I'm suggesting is that given the fact that MMT provides a policy base, a, a, a foundation for delivering both what red, pe red state people would like to see and blue state people would like to see. Is there a way to, is there a one stop, a silver bullet in terms of trying to penetrate that duopoly narrative and break that down? It, it, have you all begun looking into commonalities that affect larger coalitions of red blue um, individuals? Well, I, I think there are political choices that have to be made and that I would make. Uh, and uh, uh, it will perhaps not surprise you uh, to, uh, to know that uh, in the last election uh, I stood with, with, with the overwhelming majority of the citizens of Texas backing the socialists from Vermont. Uh, now, <laughs> what was the... Uh, What was the basis of that argument? Well, it was one that uh, traded the banker votes for a stronger base uh, in the industrial working class. That's a trade I would make. It's a trade, however, I mean, you, you, it, it, it's, it, it's, I don't think there's any way to patch over that difference. If you had a Sanders-led Democratic Party, it would have to fund itself in some different way. And so you would have to build a political formation capable of sustaining a majority uh, in a way which has not been done in this country since, well, quite a few decades. But that is, I think, the task in front of the Democratic Party. It cannot be both a, an effective popular party uh, and a, 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 a party of, uh, that is completely complacent before the policy agenda of big finance. These are incompatible objectives. And that, and that shows up. The inequality measurements here are, they're interesting, they're useful, but they're merely reflective of that underlying reality. They just show what we already know from our experience. Due to time constraints, we're going to end it with that and thank Dr. Galbraith for his time and his wonderful talk.